One of the most interesting composers that England produced in the 18th century was a man called Charles Avison, born in 1709 and centred his entire working career on Newcastle. He was a composer, of course. He was a director of music at public events. He was also a great writer on music. And sitting on my music shelves, I came across recently and was reminded of a book he published in 1752 called Essay on Musical Expression. And here is the first edition of it. If you pour yourself a cup of coffee, you can read the whole thing in about 40 minutes. And the part that caught my attention recently is when essentially he says to the reader that music in his time can be divided up into two categories. He says there is good music in our time and there is bad music. And essentially into the com category of good composers, he mentions people such as Hasse, who was one of the great German composers of opera, and I suppose next to Handel, um, one of the finest opera composers of the 18th century. He also mentions Handel too, and he's very, very fond of Corelli. But he goes on to list the composers that he doesn't think are very good. And the list is quite intriguing. He says, into the first and lowest class of composers are Tesserini, Locatelli, who I've noticed has become quite popular again recently, Vivaldi, which is extraordinary, particularly given his popularity today, and a composer called Alberti. Now, Alberti I've always found quite an interesting chap. He came to London in the first half of the 18th century, made quite a success for himself, and published a number of keyboard sonatas. And though the keyboard sonatas are not necessarily known by many today, his name is, because his name is given to a particular figuration in music, and his name is given because he used this figuration over and over again. And this is what he used so frequently. So he took the first degree of the scale, the fifth, the third, and then the fifth again, and then repeated it over and over again. And if you look at the keyboard sonatas that he wrote, it's this that accompanies so many of the melodies that occur in the right hand. It's a very, very good little device. And I don't think that it, for, a, for a moment that he actually invented it, but he certainly used it so much that retrospectively we call this figure, as I said, the Alberti bass. And it is a wonderfully useful little affair. You could accompany practically anything with this as a accompaniment. Or if you're feeling patriotic. wonderfully useful for all melodies to be accompanied. And you don't really have to be a very proficient keyboard player to make use of it. When you turn to the sonatas then of Alberti, he uses it over and over again. I think to the point where it becomes no longer interesting as music. But here, for example, is sonata number six, which I'm using from an edition published by John Walsh in 1748. and on and on the sonata goes. You realize that once he set that little line in motion in the left hand, he finds it very, very difficult to let go. And the result is, I'm afraid, music that is a little on the dull side. However, a slightly higher grade composer, in fact, a very much a higher grade composer, could come along and using the same device, I think, make great music out of it. And another composer, in fact also from Venice, Alberti came from Venice, this composer did as well, Baldassare Galuppi arrived in London and again was very very popular with keyboard players of the time and here is a sonata which also uses this Alberti bass but somehow the melodic interest I think is much much better than Alberti.
and so on. I think musically the result is altogether better, but still there is this sense that uh, the music is being dominated by the Alberti bass, and even a lover of this particular sonata, I think, will tire of the endless flow of those figurations. It's interesting to see that these, the use of the Alberti bass isn't confined to these second class composers, as Avison might have called them, but actually Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, all use this at some stage in their writings. Let's turn for a moment to the music of Mozart. In fact, a piano sonata that he wrote in 1778, and in the Kirchel catalogue of Mozart's music, it's K332. Now, I'm interested particularly in the second movement. If you listen, for example, to the left hand, another key, but once again, the Alberti bass is going strong in the left hand as a general purpose accompaniment figure to what's going on in the right hand. But Mozart's music is altogether on another plane. And I think though he uses the Alberti bass quite consistently in the opening sections of the music, he keeps the music alive by making the melodic line very interesting in that it constantly flows in and out of accidents or uses um, accidentals in every bar. And also he passes through a, a series of very, very interesting keys. And those things combined keep the music afloat. And the listener's ear, I think, is diverted away from the Alberti bass. So here, for example, is the opening bar of the music, which is totally blameless, sticks fervently to the key of B-flat. But halfway through the bar, Mozart introduces, against the E-flat that I've just played, an E natural, which immediately gives the music an, an energy that it, without it, it wouldn't have. suddenly we have a pull on what is technically a wrong note. Now he's only travelled a few inches into the music and he's already playing with the keys. And this, I think, is the thing that uh, makes the music great. We know that we're in for repeat at this point. Mozart feels it's right to do so, the ear expects it. But rather than the repeat coming in B-flat major, which is how we began the music, now it comes in B-flat minor. So Mozart arrives at the point we wish him to be at, which is the dominant in the music, but he's done so by an extraordinary route. And if you were then to calculate the number of bars he's gone through, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and compare that with Alberti, more happens in those eight bars of Mozart's music than happens in the entire sonata by Alberti, or to be fair, even Galuppi that you heard earlier. Mozart knows exactly how to wield that Alberti bass in the accompaniment. Now, when you talk about Alberti basses, of course, you're not just confined to the figuration of one, five, three, five, and so on. You could say that um, it could run like this, provided the pattern goes on repeating itself, and it can also be made into triplets. wanted to make Barbara Black Sheep skip in triple time. That's how you might do it. So when you then turn to Beethoven, let's quickly fish him off the shelves, to the Moonlight Sonata, if you were to say to a music lover, sing the opening of the Moonlight Sonata, they almost certainly would sing the triplets that one hears in the first bar. and so on, and not the, the principal theme, which comes a little bit later. Yum, ba -bum, bum, ba -bum, and so on. And here, Beethoven has done an extraordinary thing. He's taken the Alberti style figuration from the left hand, which would have accompanied a melody in the right, say something like this. 
He's now given the music a bass in the left hand, puts the Alberti figuration into the right, and eventually, in the upper part of the right hand, actually directed by the little finger, we have Alberti bass in the lower part of the right hand and melody in the right. And you put them all together, you end up with the Moonlight Sonata. So there's the Alberti bass in the right hand now. Almost melodic in character because we're so slow. But don't be fooled. Because here comes the true first subject in the top of the right hand. bass rightfully taking its place to support the melody. And then clever Beethoven moves into the minor key to keep the interest going. And rather like Mozart in his sonata is off in a very, very interesting harmonic direction. This helps keep the Alberti bass afloat. And once more, as we looked through the Sonata of Alberti to see the, the bass continuing from start to finish, so in Beethoven those triplets never stop. But again, we have a composer of a much, much higher calibre who dares himself to run forward with this cheapest of musical devices and turns it into truly great music.